Uh, welcome to another Let's Be Day. I'm Lisa and I'm back again with Elric, favourite techie guy, gets us keep it, keep us going. <laughs> um Elric will also be jumping in with any questions that may be asked on Facebook. Um I have Nicola today, who's going to be our interpreter. And our interview today is with Shield, where we have Sarah and Angela speaking today. Hiya. Hi, hello, everybody. Hiya. Morning. So would you like to give us a background about the group? Okay, so um, Shield was set up back around March the 15th. I'd been away from Fife for a decade, and I moved back to Fife on the 5th of March. And very quickly, as the sort of hype and the hysteria of lockdown and the uncertainties um, were flying around and the, there was a lot, I felt there was a lot of greed and seeing how people were behaving in shops, it really set off this heel in my tummy where I really wanted to then tap into and cater for individuals that were being deprived, being able to maybe get to the shops, whether that be, you know, an OEP whose family were preparing for their own family down south or whatever. Um, I collected some food. I went to give it to a food bank whose um, times were didn't really fit in user friendly with my time scale and schedule. And I went to take the food to the local co-op um, because they told me that's where I could take it to find out that they weren't collecting stations anymore at that co-op because they weren't being emptied. And I was left with this food and I was like, right, well, what do I do? Came home, made a few meals, put some bags together and the rest is history, shall we say. Um, I put an appeal out for some premises because I was uh, expanding so huge at a rate that it just took, blew me away. Um, I couldn't have volunteers at my home because of obviously COVID restrictions. I didn't want strangers knowing where I lived. So it was very much a family operation between myself and my three children. And um, finally, a uh, um, local church came forward. They granted us some space that we could use to host SHIELD. And um, up until that point, I was looking after about, I think it was 88 people on my own. And then when we expanded to the church, we were able then to, to branch out to everybody else that was so desperately needing the help. And the rest is history, really. Wow. That's really good because I would just like to say I, I started a group on Facebook because I saw posts getting put up and then I started following and I watched it from the beginning when it was from your house and just saw the way it expanded over the last few months. It has been sh shocking and amazing what's, what you've been doing and everything. So do you feel that people were able to help you more when you move to the church premises better, you know? The space, I, I didn't have the capacity at my house because I needed yeah. the man for it. I needed the hands on board. I needed the, I needed the trust. You know, I, I had a, a girl, Emma, who is one of our volunteers who I went to school with, and she was literally, um, and another lady, Lisa, who had grown up with since I was about 12. So I felt safe telling them where I live, for them maybe to take a few parcels out. But I just didn't feel comfortable taking on new volunteers that I didn't know. I didn't want my personal space being invaded potentially by, um, you know, people that I didn't know. Um, yeah. So yeah. the need was always there. It was just that we weren't able to reach them. I wasn't able to facilitate it. Um, a huge turning point for the group was when I um, had an interesting conversation with a gentleman called David from Fairshire in Dundee. Now, um, it was unknown for a non-funded, non-formal or community group to secure a fair share contract because we didn't really exist. Um, and my argument was, there's OAPs that are getting COVID boxes that are too heavy for them to lift. They don't have the fine motor skills for them to open the tin. They maybe don't know how to cook because their wife cooked for them and they've been living off convenience meals in the microwave. And this category of person were being massively let down. And really, it was almost an insult to have a big box of food that they could do nothing with. And David at the time was like, yeah, they get their boxes, they're cared for. So I put this argument across that, yeah, they might qualify for a box, but they don't have key workers to help with the food prep. 
they maybe don't know how to work an oven or they maybe can't afford to to run their gas seven days a week to cook the meals where it's cheaper just to throw it in the microwave and we secured that contract on the the passion that i really felt i just knew in my heart that yeah the boxes were great but they weren't user friendly they were a generic box the feedback that we've had from the boxes five council have asked me to give some feedback on the feedback that we've had firsthand um they were just a standard food box um a lifeline to many but an insult to a lot yeah um do you feel five has five council offered any help towards your group i approached five council approximately six weeks ago myself to speak to them um the gentleman that i've spoken to he's been very supportive and complimentary of the work that we've done um the certain organizations within fife council i don't think have been very complimentary to some of the work that we've done however this gentleman has been we've been ridiculed on social media at times from fife council staff and um, questioning you know our, our 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 ethos why do we do it the truth is we're just a group of people with good hearts so that people were needing help and that was our only motive and i think we've kind of been the underdog throughout the whole process and proven a lot of even established groups that the work that we do um, has been amazing and combined ultimately if we're all just trying to help one another we would complement one another so where we're with and i'm going to be quite frank and quite honest because um, i'm quite transparent and, and i'm known for it at the moment there has been no offer from five council um, but that would be something that would take weeks and months to come to at some sort of an arrangement Mm -hmm. and the biggest hindrance for ourselves as a group and we've discussed it quite openly we don't want to rush into any form of partnership with anybody else because if there was another lockdown or if there was another incident where we all had to be all hands on deck sometimes there's too much red tape mm -hmm. and then you're leaving that category of people vulnerable again and there's no provisions in place yeah. for that so yeah. we're kind of stuck between uh, a rock in a hard, what is it, a hard place. <laughs> um, so I'm not down on Fife Council. I'm hoping at some point when and if the time is right, we, we could they could complement us, but I don't think a partnership is something that we would need from Fife Council. Um, but some support, like for example, maybe they offer if we could borrow one of their, their vans or if we could qualify for volunteers' expenses. Um, or if there's a, a situation that we know that we can help somebody, if they can maybe offer their resources to us to make us speed the process up. But a formal partnership, I don't think at the moment would be the right thing for for the group. Yeah, so, you have to think, you have to think about what is for your group, what you're trying to achieve at, at this moment in time. And we're so fluid. We're we're all learning. We've never done voluntary work. We don't romanticise it. We don't. We don't have the knowledge enough to be able to turn around and say, right, this is what our main focus is going to be. This is what we're going to do. We are led by the needs of the community at the moment, and the needs of the community just now have changed so much from March. They're going to change again at Christmas. They're going to change again next year, and would almost be detrimental to the group, I think, if we were to get ahead of ourselves, make a formal decision on something, and then potentially, you know, sabotage the group so yeah it's quite important to <laughs> have, have a kind of a group identity you know what you do like all the organizational forms and all that uh it's yeah that comes afterwards you really know what the group is about you're learning yourselves as you're doing uh, what, what matters and uh but you you there's a lot of voluntary organizations out there as well that are doing similar kind of work so you don't necessarily have to just think about uh like partnerships with uh things like like public sector nhs five council whatsoever you can you can always work side by side to other voluntary organizations who are also doing the same thing of sussing out how they're working and learn in parallel it's, it's kind of like a complementary approach and definitely and, has yeah. to be organic you know it has to be the right fit it has to be people with the same outlooks and hearts as ourselves all these other groups do genuinely amazing amazing work 
but it has to for us to be able to do the best job possible and um, other organizations they also have to feel at home with shield and we have to feel at home with the work that they do and we're very lucky that we we are in talks with a few organizations privately that we're building up a rapport building up a trust because at the end of the day because we're not established i wouldn't expect any other formal um, organization to to want to come on board with us because they need to know that we're in it for the long haul and that we are efficient at what we do and ethical with what we what we do so the, the, we go by intuition in this group and the time the time will come we're led by intuition quite a lot yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, that's how you can be responsive directly to the members of, of a community that you're working with. It's because you're reconnected to them, and uh, that, that's that's the main thing, really. <laughs> it's how to actually listen to everyone directly. Uh, well, anyway, FC would be really keen to help, if anyways, but we're there anyway, and we're here to talk a bit more and, and spread the word. So it's really good to, to actually you. hear that you're doing this. We, we work with a lot of groups that uh, they wouldn't want to become uh, formal groups as such. They want to stay a informal uh voluntary association some of them are just like uh yeah it's just a membership they're just there for each other's members and you don't have to be railroaded to become a formal organization very soon uh, what matters is actually what is it that you are about and how you do it but you should tell us a bit about uh how is it that you're organizing all this uh your volunteers you, uh, do you have a a um like, is there a, a routine uh, or is it just like you adapt over time? What's a normal day like if it's such a normal day? Or um, We have individuals within the group that would have their own specific roles. So for a long time, um, members of the group might have thought I was a bit of a control freak because I wanted to work alongside everybody. I needed to know their skill sets. I needed to know what motivated them. I needed to know um, where their, their qualities and their strengths were rather than allocating them to a role that it was never going to be, you know, their, 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 their strength. Um, and then feel disheartened when you ask them to go into a different role. So for a long time, we all just mucked in together. We all did the same roles, but um, within a sort of schedule. And then one day I just went in, I was like, like Lorna, you're running the food bank. Angela, you're going to be um, dealing with the catering side of stuff. Um, and then Emma was like, right, we want to get you onto um, the, the fundraising, uh, that type of thing. So everyone then suddenly had a role and nobody felt left out. Whereas if I'd gone in one day and allocated one role one day, left a role the next week and somebody like, well, when's it my turn? It's almost like that. You know, when you're, you're in the playground and you, you've got your hand up waiting to be picked, you know, in, in group exercises. And I, I, don't, I don't want that in this group. We're all equal. We've all got strengths and we all need to tap into them. And um, even with our um, service users, we'll say to them, do you have skills? You know, what, what is it that you, you do or you used to do? Or um, And then we'll have some of our service users that might help make our posters. Or um, they might help with some of my grammar because I'm mildly dyslexic. And it then gives them a sense of that they're contributing and giving something back because we all, I know my weaknesses, and one of my biggest strengths is that I recognise that. And um, yeah, so we've got, it's, okay, what, what would be your structure, would you say, within, within the group? Well, it changes from day to day because, like, the start of the week, that's when we would have quite a few volunteers in the cottage making up. Want to speak about the bags, actually, so we know what I'm talking about. Okay, so our bags, we have a system, right? This is how it works. Okay. We have literally got everything that a family or an individual needs in that bag. The boxes, the COVID boxes that were coming out, they had no cleaning products. They had shampoos, no conditioners. The um, people were left feeling quite dirty, kind of uncared for, and um, and we didn't want that in our bags. Um, so we have cleaning products, toilet roll, shampoos, conditioners, toothpaste, toothbrushes, sanitary products, um, nice hand soaps. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. Clean it. Yeah, all or any you know, all cleaning products, sponges to clean with, um, face wipes, and then we'd have our ambient um, products that Fair Share for a long time provided through their COVID contract. Um, and we were getting probably, I'd say we've had about. 
ambient products between public donations and fair share donations, realistically, I would say at least 43 tonnes worth since April. Wow. <laughs> and we've put out probably approximately 23,000 cooked meals. Oh my goodness. And that's with no formal premises, that's with no money, that's with no, um, you know, big funds or grants. We've had a couple of grants. Um, we really have. I used to go around collecting rotten bananas off doorsteps to make the banana bread. You know, <laughs> it started, I, I came up with a theory that there's need, speed and greed. And if you need something, you'll speed there to get it. You'll go and get it because you know that people need it. And as a as just the sort of soul that I am, I might not need it, but I can recognise that there's th hundreds out there that do. And then sometimes greed can come into it. When you do get money thrown at you, you can become quite complacent and maybe not go collect these other things because it's easier then just to go and buy it. Um, but food waste is a, well, you'll see oh, this firsthand. Mm -hmm. Food waste, and this is not just isolated to S5, it's a global problem. Food waste, if you were to actually see it firsthand, the food waste that we would even encounter, and we, we would literally try and be as resourceful as possible. Um, so all our cooked meals are cooked with surplus food and a combination of fair share products. Um, and they're amazing meals. I mean, you you yeah. at the menus. Yeah, so we, um, I mean, there's nothing, well, Sarah had started to talk about when you'd asked about what's the sort of structure, you know, like a oh, start off, we would do the bags for, you know, the uh, volunteers then deliver out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Um, and based on what fair share bring to us, um, so there could be mints, chicken, you know, sort of like a lot of fresh ingredients. So then we then sit down and sort of work out you know what sort of meals we're going to do with this this fresh product products. Um, the Ferlin Mosque have been amazing and have mm -hmm. let us use their kitchen. I free. was wondering where, where you were cooking the meals. Ah, I said the oh, mosque, excellent. Obviously, cooking on a mass scale, you need. You know, we do have volunteers. Um, well, everybody even in within the group cook meals at home. Um, they are then put into plastic containers with lids and labelled and stuff. And then they're put in, we have like big chest freezers that we use to store all these meals. And then maybe sort of come the middle of the week, volunteers then start come pick up meals that are then distributed to obviously certain service users. They so can then store them and put them, they just have to microwave these meals then. They're all, you know, healthy, balanced meals. They're cooked with fresh meat where possible. All the sort of, you know, vegetables and everything, you know, that you would look for in, you know, a healthy, balanced meal for any age group. Uh, how, you know, you, how are you distributing all this? Like, was it 43 tons all this time? <laughs> Our cars. You're on, you're on transport, you're doing this directly. My yeah. car's wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Wow, that's crazy. We also we um have we pick up from Reside Co-op, Crossford Co-op, Valleyfield Co-op, Pilmuir Street, Shamrock Street, Oakley, and who have missed out? Mm. Uh, Lindburn. Lindburn, would you? We collect seven nights to oh and King Beef, eight. We have I, I do three of the nights around some of them. Lorna does, I think, seven nights. We have volunteers that also do six, mm -hmm. seven nights. Um, seven days a week, we will go and collect this food that would go in the bin and we cook a bit and we allocate it about in the bags. And what we've been doing is, and we make our service users extremely clear on this fact, that we remove it out the packaging, we put it into clear packaging, to get out their head that there is a problem with um, the mm. sell, the sell -by. there's a difference between sell by and use by. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 
re-educating people a wee bit and breaking down that stigma that you know that you, you shouldn't be eating it. Obviously, there's certain things we would not put out because um, we don't know how long they're maybe going to be sat in the bag if they don't empty the bag into the fridge. But things like fruit, vegetables, salads, there's absolutely nothing wrong with these um, items and and the veg. And uh, it's just we I would say on average we would probably collect easily a night over £400 worth of food retail. Now, obviously, it's been reduced, and it's not that I'm talking about the retail face value. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, it, it shows, shows you how much shops can have as waste, though. And, and this isn't just the co-op. I mean, the co-op are trying to battle and are fighting to try and combat this, this problem. This is across the UK. All big retailers, they, 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 it's just written off. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, and um, so that'll be an area that, as things calm down here and we've got more headspace, we will be devising and come up with a some sort of solution to to that problem, um, because the amount of waste is just phenomenal, and it's not just that's the plastic waste that, that goes along with it too. Yeah. It's, it, it's the way, and we are quite passionate about the plastic waste because one of our volunteers is from Plastic Freedom Permlin. Mm -hmm. So it's been lovely having James as a volunteer, not only for the work that he does for the group, but re-educate us and tell us what better user-friendly ways that we can maybe do things. And at the moment, it's difficult because we don't have the funding to implement all the changes that we'd like, but we're mm -hmm. making small changes. Um, and yeah, we will take the plastic free pledge, which we're not done at the moment because we can't commit to it. We'd yeah. be hypocritical. We want to, but at the moment we can't. Yeah, packaging is a massive, massive problem. I mean, we have volunteers going to the tip seven days a week to get rid of even just packaging, cardboard, plastic. Yeah. So is that, is that what, what so you're getting rid of to, to actually get uh, exactly. less, yeah, you're repackaging it less less dangerous or less environmentally or, polluting ones? Yeah. Well, huh. we, yeah. we would love a commercial waste for free if five councillors are watching. <laughs> we've not asked for anything. <laughs> um, like a few things that you're aware of that we've done. We'll for share you. the video. We'll share the video. Come <laughs> on. We're getting there. <laughs> But see these small changes. See, <laughs> see these small changes that you are making. You know, the people that you're helping and everything, it's going to impact on them and they're going to see this. They're going to make slight changes as well in what they're doing. We have, even to their diet, we have um, one unnamed, because I always will be anonymous, a service user who didn't know how to cook. Now, it was an individual that um, had never had the opportunity to be shown how to cook. You can't go into the circumstances behind it through the childhood. Um, we provided a slow cooker and every Wednesday I would phone and the food that they'd had that day, I would then sit, literally sit on a WhatsApp FaceTime and show them how to cook in a slow cooker. So wow. one impact. And I, I mean, we could list loads that we've done and there's so much that this group don't talk about publicly because we're not here for the glory, we're not here for the recognition, we're just here to help people. Confident. Yeah, and it's confidential, it's private. Yeah. And we want to break that stigma of individuals being too embarrassed to come forward, because if you're sometimes gloating about the work, rightfully, you should be bragging about some of the work that you do, but it can sometimes put people off actually coming forward. Mm -hmm. And we want everybody um, to come forward, and we're, we're especially passionate at the moment about the work in poverty. And I'm just going to, I'm not one to shy away. There, there's no elephant in any room with, with us, right, with S.H.I.E.L.D. It's the work in poverty that are going to get our economy back up and running, okay, because they aren't used to a benefit system. They um, are used to having a certain um, lifestyle. It can, they've never maybe had the, the impact of going on a benefit system and then suddenly it's affecting their mental health and they've never experienced that before. Mm -hmm. So we're passionate about building the, the, the bridge between food banks and shops and break that stigma. Um, food banks are brilliant. Um, I'm not taking away from the work that they do. However, as a, as, as a group, 
we don't want to feed the problem with food. We want to rehabilitate it. So mm -hmm. we're in the slow, we're, we're, we're down here. We know where we want to go. We know how we're going to do it, but it's just going to take time. Until that time, we're just going to continue doing what we're doing, the work that we're doing. And yeah, we've got we've got a brilliant team. We're, we're lucky, aren't we? Yeah, we're very. And we're in a bubble, so we'd like to sit close. We, we oh, need I to see. <laughs> so I'm in a bubble with Lorna's family because I don't have any um, immediate. I've got a sister locally, but she's got her own wee family and busy. So I don't have a mum local. I don't have my dad. So it was nice that as as a community group, we've become our, a bubble, like it's, extended it's family kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've uh. seen you cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we've all had a good cry at times. Uh, we all do. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. It's really amazing what you're doing. And I think that's uh, it's really good that you're seeing this complementary side. It's not uh, it's it's not a food bag. They're doing already amazing work on that side, but you're trying to divert away from the waste and and the lack of or maybe self knowledge or empowerment that people have to actually turn things around for their health, for their well being and everything. So it's a really interesting project. So yeah, I do hope you you don't have just uh, you're not just like 100% just doing stuff and, and not enough time to actually develop your project. And I hope you have some time uh, to actually think as well, <laughs> not just do, 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 and just come well, back. Quite yeah. honestly, up until maybe two weeks after we moved into the cottage, it consumed all of our lives. We, but we're okay with that. It was a commitment that we made. Um, it was something that we morally, all as a group, had made that commitment to. And it's been a huge, like for example one of our volunteers is now a co-op pioneer now this is something that, that this individual would never in a million years thought about doing and she voluntarily after seeing the relationship that we were building up with the co-op felt compelled that you know what i want i want to get on board on that i mean i'm now so passionate about fair share um, i'm passionate about other voluntary organizations as are as are you you know so it's it's been a lifeline to us as individuals within our private lives that it, COVID, we had two options. We could have sat and got consumed with the social media and all the stuff that your mind was processing and trying to make sense of. But this has been an amazing sort of, um, well, it's definitely been a lifeline for me. It's yeah. kept me busy, it's yeah. kept me sane. Um, but up until we moved, no, it was consuming everything. But I think the group probably have even noticed that become a wee bit not lazy, but I've taken the time out. Mm -hmm. I'm getting more headspace to make decisions more, you know, with with thought and consideration. And um, we all needed that. Would you feel like you've taken a step back a wee bit, or? Um, yeah, I yeah, but it's still there. It's a you know, it's seven days a week. Well, this you is know, a, there's always something. Yeah. 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 Definitely, seven days a week. There, yeah. is, there is no set hours. My individuals from Facebook will know. I've replied to a message sometimes at one o'clock in the morning if I've heard my phone go off. Nobody reaches out for for no reason. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and we as um, volunteers, we try and send the same volunteer to th that area. So you build up rapport, you build up a connection, you build up a relationship. Um, so it's not like ding dong ditch where you chat the door, you leave it and you run. You know, they're, you're engaging with them. And I think that was one reason why our group thrived, that they actually felt that they were an individual and not just a ticket mm -hmm. or a time slot. Mm -hmm. or um, you're just another statistic you're you're a human being you're going through a really hard crappy time and we're here and we're going to help you as best as we can and if we can't help we'll bloody find somebody and they're vulnerable can. you know they're very vulnerable there's a lot of vulnerable people and you know to build that trust with them you know even if it is once a week delivering bags of supplies to them you know it's um, like you say it's you know, making them feel, you know, that they they are a person, they're not just a, another number or. You it's know, uh, it's that extra thought that you're doing, as you say. It's not like a, a standard box. It's something that they can they can work. I think what you were mentioning about all the people 
receiving a box of things that I can't use this. I don't know how to do this, or I don't have a capacity to do so. Are you doing the fraud behind it? That's really great. The amount of shielding boxes that got donated into our group was whoever got that contract, bravo. I hope you have a lovely holiday in the Bahamas because you seriously, I mean, it must have cost thousands to put these things together, but they were so generic. Whereas our boxes were like, do you have allergies? Is there things you don't like? And you'll always say, like, no, I like everything. But you'll know, do you like tuna? No, no, I don't like tuna. Chickpeas? No, not that type of thing. So we would then just not put these things in. Or if they have a policy, we have a policy that if something goes in by mistake that they don't like, give us it back. And they do. We mm. get it back. So it, it's, it's lovely. And we note down if one week, if they got bleach one week, we'll know that they maybe don't need bleach the next week. Or if they got um, a big thing of washing powder, you know, the week before, we'll know that they don't need it the next. So the bags are, are rotating and changing and it keeps our stock levels, you know, so we're mm. never, it took us easily 16 weeks, 17 weeks, I would say, before we could even consider ourselves as a bank because we had nothing by the end of the week. Wow. Okay. Nothing. And you've got to remember, you know, you're heavily relying on volunteers. Uh -huh. Heavily. A lot of volunteers have gone back to work, work now. now, you know, stuff like that, other commitments um, and donations. Donations. Yeah. It's not yeah. all just about food. You know, we've got, you know, there's clothes, there's books, there's toys, there's, you know, it's not just about giving people, you know, food. No. Some people, you know, because of what's been happening, they can't afford clothes. Mm -hmm. Kids going back to school. There's no money there to buy, you know, what, what they need and stuff. And to be put in that situation, um, like you say, yeah. it's difficult for people to reach out. And that was the three things that I set up from the house was the food bank, the clothing bank and the education bank, because I knew those were the three key areas that were going to need attention. And at first, when I had all these calls and I was like, oh, it was so overwhelming. And I thought well, I've made a mistake, but do you know what? I've really, really not, because I don't think people actually ha have any concept, apart from our volunteers, of what difference those clothes make to people. And it's not just clothes, we've beds, washing machines, and um, we've done a house move for somebody that was fleeing a um, domestic relationship. Um, there's so much that we don't talk about that we've we've done and I'm very, very proud of my volunteers and I'm pr proud of the privacy. It's, it's not, we don't even need to talk about it. We don't need to say to a volunteer, you don't discuss, we just don't. Any referrals that even come through, I don't even tell them, this, the volunteers, the, the situation. The you don't need to know the It's all private. It's, I uh, know that matters. So yeah. I'll maybe go towards like, um, mm -hmm. Make sure there's extra such and such because I know that maybe that individual has the need needs those things for a reason. And a volunteer might look and be like, "Well, why are they needing like 500 nabums?" That's an exaggeration, but it's like, "Well, you don't need to know, right?" So, and now we just know that if it's on there, don't question it. Just, just, just do what's just, written on the just sheet. Just do what's on the sheet because there's always there's always a reason. Um. So, and you understand if you know, I would say 80 percent of the volunteers have got a story. Yeah. We've all got a story. We've all got things that have happened. So the understanding there, you know, you understand the situations as they come in. You know, yeah. we've all been there at, at some point. You know, I would, so. yeah, I would agree. And uh, and the girls are quite open about it. Between our volunteers, that I think um, there's two of them that have had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. You know, I I've been homeless with mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. domestic abuse. Um, you know, you'll have your your stories. Um, we've got a volunteer that um, would have challenges with his autism and had been bullied and, and you know, in his, his past. That we have all got a story to tell. Sorry, that's the door. Uh, Angela's just going to go and get it. Um, and there is no secret formula. The truth of it is, if you're doing something for the fact that you just want to be a good person, it's actually quite easy. If you can mm -hmm. put your open heart into it and experiences. Um, so, yeah. We, we, we've had some 
quite shocking uh, testimonies of people that were saying were opening to them during the lockdown and, and the repercussion. And I don't know if it's a, it's a, it's a big topic or a chat of its own, but you, you mentioned an ed education bank. And uh, can you tell a bit more about that? Because I think a lot of people had, had really difficult times of homeschooling and, and all that. So is, is that related to that? I had issues with homeschooling. <laughs> Lisa wants, Lisa wants to talk about it. So not <laughs> He's back at school, but I had issues with that. <laughs> My children first time got no homeschooling because I have no internet where I live. Moved in on the 5th of March, the BT can't get a supply, and that was just closed maybe about three weeks ago where they held their hands up and said, no, we can't do it. So I understand the frustrations of not being able to do home education, but Sometimes people have the resources, it's just that they don't have the, they don't prioritise it. And there's a lot of children that maybe didn't have access to things that they maybe could have and should have. So the education bank side of things, we kept it very private because I was quite conscientious. I didn't want to mimic any other um, group. And we have the cloud, which do amazing work. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the cloud on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be a cloud environment during COVID. If I said, we've got a laptop, who needs that? And then everyone's fighting over a, over a laptop. We would just silently work out what families were in need and say, would this be a benefit to your household? Could you make use of this? Could you make use of that? So it was done privately. Um, so we've given out pens, papers, um, pencil cases, laptops, um, worksheets, books, um, what else? I'm trying to say. Oh, dongles. I've given dongles out to families so they can get the internet access. Um, and I'm proud of that because it's nice that you can do that in the background without. You don't want people. You, all systems are going to be abused. And the best way for us to eliminate and keep our workload at a level that we could cope with, we had to protect that. So we couldn't go public with too much because we didn't, we couldn't facilitate it and we can't man it. And the worry that we would have if somebody donated something and then they were then to go and sell it on the marketplace, that then has a detrimental sort of leaves a bad taste that these people have gifted items to us for free and then somebody potentially just go on and sell it right under our nose, which yeah. I felt if we had to go public with, people would have abused it. But there's been times I've called people out that I've known have abused our system and have maybe taken liberties and I've not been shy and saying to them, you'll not be getting, you'll, you, you'll not be getting again because mm -hmm. we are not funded and I've had to signpost them to formal organisations and say, that's where you go. And it's hard, but we need to protect the, the stuff that, that we have doing, and yeah. we're all people are not going to facilitate people who don't want to necessarily try or attempt to help themselves or abuse our, our, our kindness, which is so difficult. It's, it, there's a fine line. But one question, which is, uh, how can people get involved as volunteer? That pops up from out there. So. Lovely, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, volunteers have always been a bit, so when we first started, I was like, I can't have anybody who's a key worker volunteering because they're out in the, the thick of it that could potentially bring in a cross contamination. Um, can't bring in somebody whose husband was maybe a paramedic because he's then out there. So it's not that we're um, stingy with who we have volunteering. We put a lot of thought into it. And um, the truth of it is, see the church, they had a whole army of people that we were able to. They are the most amazing people. Um, yeah, they would just we just utilise them and worked as a team. Now that's obviously scaled down now. But yes, we will be looking for volunteers, especially on the road up to Christmas. I've got a few people, and all you have to do is drop an, an email, or you can contact the group, um, and we can talk about it. But at the moment, till COVID reduces we won't be able to be taking on volunteers that mm -hmm. maybe do work yeah, to be safe yeah. there but you will have skills elsewhere even if you want to help by sharing things from the facebook page or by talking about us and by engaging with people about the work that we do that that's that's even 
Karen donation then? But at Christmas time, we've got lots of plans. I've got a meeting on Friday with Fife College and I'll hopefully have some definitive answers because everything's dependent on what they allow us to do. And rightfully, it's their premises, it's it's their rules. and um, They need to protect their, you know, their, their college. So um, we'll have more of an update for Christmas, but it's going to be an exciting time and we will be needing volunteers. Okay. What's that all? Excellent. So Lisa, I thought you were you were wanting to talk more about homeschooling, but hey, never no. mind. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, come on, go for it. <laughs> so, I, I can tell. I, I can tell. I, I think I just got all my homeschooling issues <laughs> finished as soon as my child went back to school full time on the seventeenth of August. I was like, yes. <laughs> We need to be. You need to be. I think the maggot school. It was hard. It was hard. Yeah. But I felt like you know they made the kids do all these activities online. Like some people did have an, not having the technology to do it. They would be offered it on paper, like a booklet or something instead. And um, but with my child, it was he could he, he admitted to me himself. He says I can't focus, and I was going to college at the same time, and I couldn't focus at home. So I understood. So I just made him pick the subjects that he was like his favourites, and just says right, do what your favourites, and we'll deal with anything later on. <laughs> I think for, for, the, for the record, I think you had the right approach. We'll never get uh -huh. this time. It was a scary time for them as it was. Yeah. And you don't want them to have memories of you screaming, shouting at them, trying. You need to, you need to, you know, they just need to be happy. They need to feel safe and they need to feel supported um, emotionally. So I think you did the right thing. And I think we all carried an element of parental guilt. Um, yeah. Mine did I'm not losing sleep over it. Um, they had a different COVID experience. I'm sure your son was. <laughs> 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 We've all had that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh. Guidance teacher saying he hadn't even logged in for three months. So <laughs> we're <gonna> go there. <laughs> <laughs> all right then. <laughs> it's just understood. It's just yeah. understood. But no, it's, it's good to hear that you know you're helping. You know, people need to understand not just about the food. You're there for like clothing. You're doing the edu the education side, whatever way you can to help people. You know, so you're expanding ideas that he might not have expected to do it. The thing, and it's because of lockdown, you've had to adapt to it, to what's been needed by your team. We're, yeah. we're very resilient as a group yeah, and yeah. proactive. We don't think, we just do. We, we don't have the, we never had the luxury because a lot of people be like, oh, you need to research this and you need to, we didn't have time. That That's the truth. We were just totally on autopilot that if we'd had the time to research stuff, I think it might have actually intimidated us and hindered us a wee bit because we're like, oh, we don't want to tread on their toes or we don't want to insult so-and-so. But I think it went in a benefit that I didn't know any of the organisations because I've been away for a decade and I didn't know, I'd maybe heard of certain groups and what have you, um, but we just we just got on with it. And at the end of the day, if all these groups were functioning and doing the, jo the their job, which they are, but somebody's not doing the role that we're doing or we mm -hmm. wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. So there's somebody's not they're either not filling it or they're not doing it. So we uh -huh. need to find our feet, find out where our strengths lie, and we'll we'll maybe continue. And in months' time, we might focus on something completely different. We just we don't know. Uh -huh. And it's but again, I'll just seen... a start break. If anyone's watching, would like start. Break. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but it's good that it's good that you've seen that you've filled a spot that nobody else was thinking of help, helping within that area kind of thing. Yeah, we've covered up to Glasgow. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not, I mean, we, we, 
at one point we were all the way up to Methyl, Glenrothes. We still cover up to um, Falkland. Uh -huh. um, we or we would even take things up to Fife Zoo. Um, we've we've given things okay. just endless. So uh, amazing stuff, really good. And so for the next months ahead, is there anything you'd, you'd like to share as a message? Any links? Any posters? Any calls? Anything like I that? Would, we'll, would, we'll share it for you. We are a group about gratitude. We will thank every individual. We will thank every organisation. We'll not sit here and be like, oh, we did this. We couldn't have done any of it with the likes of the co-op, fair share. Um, we have had um, other businesses, which maybe if later, if it's okay with you, if I maybe put a thank you together mm -hmm. and you could maybe share it. And we just really, really, really need the public to know that this is a group for them. Um, we're motivated by them. Um, if they want to support us in any way, we would ask them to support us. Um, it doesn't matter how big or how small. Once it's all combined, you know, and it snowballs, it has a huge, huge uh, impact. And you know, just want to try and compliment any of your other groups that you've spoken to too. It's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I've not had the chance to speak to some of you. I've maybe we've maybe had a group donated stuff that we've had excess of and reached out. And I would urge you to please. We'd love to talk. We'd love to compliment you in any way, um, and you know, it'd be it'd be nice. You know, yeah. um, we felt quite isolated at times by other groups. All right, okay. Um, so it'd be good if sorry, and we're just just a shout out to one of your gentlemen that you're going to have later on who sponsored our t-shirts, and I'll, I'll leave that I left this for the big grand reveal. Yay! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the <tenders>. Hey. <laughs> So, yeah, he's been amazing because we recognise that although he had downplayed the bagpipes for, I think, 14 years, he, wow, he went out on his own. So we we said we're looking for somebody to sponsor our T-shirts. He came forward, he paid for half and we paid for the other half because we want to support new business. People have been able to tap into um, skills that had been suppressed by the nine to five. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they lacked mm -hmm. confidence or they didn't have the time. And COVID, if anything, has gifted these people the opportunity to tap into their skill sets, the things that you know that they they have in here, but they haven't released. And the amount of new startups, the amount of new businesses, um, large and one day will be huge. Is it's exciting? I'm excited about the future. I'm not worried about um, the here and now. I'm looking 80 months down the line. And um, yeah, it's going to be tough, but I think humans are tougher. And I think together. If we work together, you know, and share each other's successes, we're, we're on the right track. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Thank you. Well, that's us coming to the end of Let's Start today. Thank you to Sarah and Angela for coming along uh, from Shield. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for interpreting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Elric for coming for helping as well. So today we have at 3 p.m. on Diversity Week 5 is music from Yuli Hutchison. And tomorrow's Let's Chats at 11 a.m. with Fife College with Jade Burnett from the Fife College oh, Student Association. <laughs> yes, I love Fife College. <laughs> <laughs> And we have, like how Sarah sort of advertised, we have Dean Saunders live at 1pm doing the bagpipes for us. So please come along to all the events that we have running up to the end of Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.